Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm so very grateful for the opportunity that you continue to give us, especially in the times in which we're living. I just give you all the, the glory, the honor, and the praise. I ask sincerely that you would take and, and be our teacher to guide us into all truth, filtering out that which is foolish, sealing that which is truth to, to our hearts. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been studying together 2 Corinthians verse by verse, and in our last study together, we were at uh, around verse 12 of chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 12. In uh, writing to the believers at Corinth, the Holy Spirit has, has emphasized, first of all, the grace and the faithfulness of God. And secondly, his calling of the believers at Corinth. In the first epistle, he dealt uh, quite extensively with the carnality that existed uh, in that church, that group. Uh, much like the carnality that exists today among Christians. In 2 Corinthians, uh, he's going to present again the greatness of God, the faithfulness of God, uh, the love of God, and, and how God's grace works in the lives of Christians. This is, we're looking at how God's grace works in your life. Now, I pointed out as we began this fourth chapter that here God gives us a great ministry, a, a ministry of liberty. You know, what we would have probably said to the believers at Corinth is, well, you know, man, it's, it, this is hopeless. Uh, you know, God's done all this for you and, and uh, you've, you've rebelled against him. Uh, you've acted carnally. Uh, in fact, you've acted quite stupidly. You know, you, you haven't grasped the spiritual truth. And so God's just gonna, gonna destroy you. I mean, that's the human logic that's so prevalent today. That's the attitude of, of many Christians today toward one another. You know, I've reached the conclusion that had I been God, and the children of Israel had acted like they did in the in the wilderness, you know, I just, well, I just wouldn't have put up with it. You know, I would have just said, you know, hey, go your own way. You know, you don't want me. That's fine. I'll go find something else to do. But God never did that. You can read uh, the Old Testament and you can come away believing that God was very, 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 very hard on the children of Israel. Well, the truth of the matter is that he was nothing but gracious. When they told him uh, they despised his food. When, he, when, when they said that, he didn't stop giving them food. In fact, he gave them the same food. And we despise this light bread. You know, and what a horrible thing to say to God. Yet that's what many Christians today are, are basically saying to God in one way or another. You know, I despise your word. Yet God doesn't take it away. And if we're open-eyed, open-minded at all, as we study God's dealings with Israel, we always see Him to be a God of love, mercy, grace, a God of consistency. It's, it's Israel that's unfaithful. It's, it is Israel who is opposed to God. In fact, even hostile to God. It's Israel that's disobedient to God and, and it's always God who's faithful. They always had food. They always had water. They always had clothes. They always 
had heat. They always had shade in a, in a wild desert environment. God constantly provided for His people when they were faithful to Him. You know, then it did appear as though, you know, the chastening was uh, somewhat less. And of course, uh, to be sure, that's the case. So what we have is a fabulous ministry, a ministry of grace, a ministry of liberty, not condemnation, not destruction, And I think that's wonderful. I've, often we want to somehow impress somebody with, with how horrible hell is. And, and that's, you know, that's the threat that hangs over your life. Now, of course, the other side of that, of that coin is that if we, if we minimize that threat, then we're always concerned that you, you may be led into sin. You know, I've, I don't know how many times I've heard this. You know, just grace leads to licentiousness or something to that effect, you know. Of course, the testimony of the Scriptures is that we love God not because He threatened us. Uh, we don't love God because, you know, well, you know, we're afraid we're going to, of going to hell. Okay. We don't love God because we're afraid that if we don't, He'll take us to the woodshed We love Him because He first loved us. And if, if your love for God and His love for you, if that isn't, folks, if that is not a strong enough motivation to condition the way that you live your life, then surely the threat of hell won't work. The, the problem with the threatening situation is, is that it leads to human egotism. And, and we begin to say, how good we are, you know, and we compare ourselves with one another. When the truth of the matter is that we all bask in the grace of God, the faithfulness of God, the power of God, the sovereignty of God, the will of God, the glory of God. So we have a fabulous ministry. It is, it's fabulous. It's amazing. It's beyond description, actually. And we were told as we began the chapter, don't get discouraged. Don't get discouraged. Why should I get discouraged? You know, with a fabulous ministry. Because most people won't hear it. That's just the fact of the matter. Most people won't hear it. And as I've suggested over and over again, one of the things that I could then do you know, to make sure people hear it, well, as I can revert to trickery, I can resort to uh, deceit, to shameful tactics, to, to get you to hear the message so that, you know, I can see some kind of a result in your life and then I can pat my own self on the back and give myself credit for uh, accomplishing some amazing task. Uh, you know, when the truth of the matter is the message is hid, this glorious gospel is hid to them that are perishing. It, the gospel that we have to proclaim is hid to those who are being ruined, but it is commanded to shine in the hearts of those who are God's children. It's commanded by God to do that, and it will. So there's no reason to get discouraged. I, I, know, that, I know that there are a group of people who will not hear, and I know that there are a group of people who will who are commanded to hear, and all I have to do, folks, is proclaim the message. I just need to make sure that I'm proclaiming the right message. There's no reason to di dilute it, no, no reason at all. There's no reason to use shameful tactics at all. We spent a lot of time on this. You, you, you live in a generation, you and I live in a generation when there's, where there's more religious emphasis than there's probably been in 500 years. There's more talk about church and, and religion than there's been for generations. And yet I believe there is less Bible study 
than there's been for years and years and years. You know, if I was to look at things like the, the moral majority, and I wanted to talk about the fulfillment of prophecy, I'd say, I'd say boy, there's a prophecy fulfilled. You know, the, the church is going to try to run the political system, which God calls devilish. You know, somehow we call it fundamental. Now, I don't believe it's the fulfillment of that prophecy, but I believe it's a good indication, a pretty good, solid indication of where we're headed, where we're going. And, and God's, God's Word will not fail. As sure as day follows night, it won't fail. There will come a period of time when the church controls the political environment. It won't endure forever, but it will endure for a while until our Lord returns, as we see in the book of Revelation. All we have to do is proclaim the truth, proclaim the word. There will be those who do not hear and there will be those who do hear. And that, folks, is left up to God. So I don't need to resort to shameful tactics. Don't have to, you know, all that other stuff that people do. In the seventh verse, we, we saw that we have this treasure, this treasure, which I believe is, is the, the context clearly points out this. This is the knowledge of the glory of God. That's the treasure, I believe. We have this treasure in an earthen vessel, in a fired clay pot, says the, the Greek. You know, the disadvantage with a, with a fired clay pot is that it's very brittle. It breaks very easily. You know, one thing you, you wouldn't want to do is, is take a fired vessel made out of clay and mistreat it because it, it won't take that kind of hard treatment. But immediately we begin the 8th uh, through the 11th verse. And we find that in fact, it, it's exposed to terrible treatment. It's pressured, it's, it's persecuted, it's perplexed. It bears about in its body the dying of the Lord Jesus. The putting to death of the Lord Jesus. And here's an environment that is very hostile to this kind of an earthen vessel. Now, we could come up with all kinds of uh, reasons why God would do it that way. But Scripture simply states that He does it that way in order that the excellency of the power might be of God, not of us. That is a powerful, powerful verse, and it is a powerful indictment against modern evangelism. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be from God and not from us. You know, we're, we're put in, a, in an environment to show one thing, that the excellency, the greatness, we're put into an environment and a body to show that the excellency, the, the abundant sense of power uh, is of God, not of us. We are, we are not the source of power. You know, I, I, I look at, at what a, a real Christian looks like in this book, what a real minister of the gospel of Christ looks like, and it appears to me as though he, he's not raising multiplied millions of dollars, but he is in fact troubled on every side. He is in fact perplexed. He's persecuted. He's cast down or, or pulled down. Pulled down is, is the, the, the Greek word there. And he bears about in his body the putting to death of the Lord Jesus. That, that, that seems contrary to what I see today. That does not seem to be the normal so-called Christian uh, exercise in the presentation of the gospel 
And yet we had the same thing in the first epistle. Same thing. The Corinthians thought it was otherwise also as well. They were trying to live what they called a victorious life, a life of uh, supremacy in Corinth. You know, in fact, in the first epistle, God says they're acting as, as though the kingdom's already here and they're reigning. You know, when actually, well, they weren't called to reign. You know, that, that, that comes later. And in 1 Corinthians, we were told that the true minister of God is cast down, he's despised, he's rejected. Uh, in fact, he's considered the, the garbage of, of the church system. And that was the revelation in 1 Corinthians. And now, in 2 Corinthians, in our, in our present paragraph, you know, we got up to the 12th verse. I believe we got up to the 12th verse. We see that the environment in which we are placed and, and the operation of the true minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that environment is a hostile environment where, where the, we carry about the putting to death of the Lord Jesus so that death works in us, but life in you. Now you can take that 12th verse and you can say, you know, that death was working in Paul and, and life in the believers at Corinth. And, and that's true. That's true. I'll, I'll grant you that much. That's what the verse says. But the verse carries with it the implication that death works in you so that life works in those who hear you. That's the process. That's the process. The death is articulated in the 12th verse. So then, the death works in us, but the life, so again, art articulated in you. And the environment in which we are placed by God is an environment which God has summarized as the death. Okay? All right. In, in the last chapter of Romans, many of you who followed us through that wonderful book, we were told that the last enemy God faces is the death. And, then, uh, and that will be, that'll be swallowed up in victory in the Lord Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter 8, we are told that for the Christian, for the believer in Christ, uh, for him to be carnally minded is death. God calls that death. The death is working in us so that the life works in you. If it, if it was the other way around, you'd be looking at the victory of Paul. Boy, I, boy, I want to be like Paul. Uh, you do? When, when he stood in, in front of a group, his knees knocked together in fright. There's, there's, there's something wrong with his speech so that people that, that hear him say that he's... Uh, I, I don't know what they... I can't imagine what they said, but they said that his speech was contemptible. He's obviously not a great orator. He's, he's ill. He's, he's, uh, he's a wanted criminal in city after city. He's been in jail after jail. He's been beaten. He's been stoned. He's been left for dead. He's hungry. You know, he's got to work till, till calluses appear on his hands just to pay his own bills. You, do you want to be like that? Is that the example? of the, the, the great Christian experience. Is that, the, is that the example that you see today? I, I don't know where you're looking. I, I don't see that. You see, what we are to see is Christ. 
not Paul. But somehow we've developed a, a, a Christian philosophy that, that great Christians are, well, they're the Christians that we ought to, we ought to emulate. That is not biblical. You know, we're to emulate Paul. Well, we are, in fact, in, to imitate him, but only in the way that he walks in the, you know, in grace. The minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ is an example for all who should follow. That's what you read in Timothy. The Holy Spirit declared that Paul is the type, the prototype of the real minister. But he's, he's the minister of Christ. He's, he's not Christ. What I see is Christ. What I preach is Christ. But even that doesn't mean that that can or should uh, make us strive to be... It's not through our own efforts, okay? That's law, folks. The reason the death works in Paul is in, in order that the, wor the working in you will point you to God and not to Paul. Not to Paul's victory, not to Paul's strength, not to Paul's wisdom, uh, not to his superhuman tendencies. You know, uh, some superman that we can, you know, make into a hero. It is death that works in us so that life may work in others. That is death to self. Any true presentation of the Word of God should point us to Christ. It's not that I want to be like Paul. I want the power of Christ that the excellency of the power may be from God and not of myself. Today, the emphasis is so much on our, ourselves. Actually, the Greek says, so that the superabounding evidence of the power may be uh, from God and not from us. It is God's purpose for you and, and I to realize that the power is from God. It is not from us at all. It is not from some man's willingness to live. You know, you may have the greatest faith in the world in a bridge, but if the bridge is no good, well, you're going to fall in the river. Now God wants you to see that the excellency of the power is from God. He's the source of the power. There are no heroes of the faith, folks. Okay? Here are, we're going to slaughter another sacred cow this morning. That was not my intention, but listen, there are no such people. The greatness is the faithfulness of God. When we speak of the faith of God, we always seem to somehow be out of the language of well, of normal Christianity. You can't speak of the faith of God. Why can't I speak of the faithfulness of God, the sovereignty and the power of God? Why can't I do that? I read in Romans, but, but what then if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? Dearly beloved, the supreme message of this book is not only that Jesus Christ died in your place, it is the faithfulness, the sovereignty of God. That's why the death works in us so that the life works in you. Not, not our heroes of the faith, their faith, their strength. You know, isn't that what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2? For I determined to know nothing among you, save, except, I don't know how you translate that, Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling in my speech and my preaching were not with enticing words of man's wisdom. But, in demonstration of the Spirit and power of the Word of God, in order that your faith might not stand in the wisdom of, of men, but in the power of God.
not the wisdom of man. That's foolish. It's just foolish. I've mentioned this on numerous occasions, you know. I mean, how do you know that there was an ark? Well, God said so. Well, yeah, but that's not enough. You know, we need some evidence. You know, we got to go digging around in the ice and find a, got to find, we got to find seashells on the top of Mount Everest, you know. Folks, the, the, great, the greatest evidence to me in all of the world that there was an ark is that my God said it. My God said so, okay? That's, that's it. And my God doesn't lie. Don't need a rotten piece of wood, okay, to, to prove that. But until I learn to trust in the Word of God, all the rest is foolish and distilled. Modern preaching today, in the main, is an effort to get your faith to stand in the wisdom of men and not in the power of God. Are you really going to try to? Are you really telling me, folks, that it's 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 more important to find a piece of rotten wood than it is to trust what God said? I believe the walls of Jericho fell down flat. Okay, why do I believe that? Because God said so. You know, and if you took a shovel over there, or, you know, a spade over there, and you dug up Jericho and you said, well, you know, we've, we've just proved that they didn't. I wouldn't believe you because I believe God. I believe that there are tremendous efforts underway today to try to get your enthusiasm, to get your faith, whatever it is, established in human wisdom. Christians twist the scriptures so that they can make fact fit the word of God. You know, we tend to put a lot of a lot more uh, credence in what we can see and handle than what we read in the Word of God. When this chapter ends in the in the 18th verse, we're going to find that we don't look at the things that are seen, but the things that are eternal. I'm pretty much convinced that if you know if you walk down the street and you, and you tap some guy on the shoulder and you say, hey, you know, hey, hey, uh, uh, did you know that science just proved that there's a God? I think that person would say, well, well, I'm not surprised. You know, I always thought that there was a God, but I'm just as equally convinced. You know, that if I tap that guy on the shoulder and I said, you know, hey, man, did you know that, that science has just proven that there is no God? I think that same person would say, well, no, I'm not surprised. You know, I never thought that there was a God. You know, it wouldn't make any difference to him. Folks, imagine what it must sound like to the almighty, majestic God, the creator of heaven and earth, the one who hung the, the stars in the heavens. You know, when he says something and, and you wonder whether or not it's true. I believe Israel crossed the Red Sea or the Reed Sea, however you, you know, however it's, you say it, or on dry land. I really believe they did. I believe they did. I believe they crossed the Jordan River on dry land. I believe they did exactly what God said they did in, in the land of Israel. And we have tremendous archaeological expeditions trying to prove or disprove the, the Bible, you know, depending on, you know, well, depending on which side you happen to be on. And folks, I am not opposed to archaeology. I'm not. I am opposed to, to the, su the supreme so-called Christian effort to bring scientific evidence to bear or to prove that, 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 that God speaks truth. 
I know my God speaks tr the truth. I don't, I don't know how you feel about it, but I am absolutely ecstatic that I have some things that I can believe just because God said so. And I have a heavenly Father who cannot lie. God says some things that absolutely stagger my imagination. But I believe Him. I believe Him because I believe God. The reason death works in us is so that life does work in you. That you understand that life is Christ. The excellence of the power is from God, not from us. Verse 13. We having the same spirit of faith according as it is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. Now that quotes from the 116th Psalm, the 116th Psalm written by, by David, uh, written, written by the Holy Spirit. Uh, other ministers would say written by David. It, it was written by the Holy Spirit. We need to understand the picture here. Uh, David is a, a chosen man of God. He's, uh, here he is, he's hiding in caves He's despised. He's rejected. The entire system is out to kill him. All of the power behind it is trying to slay him. And, and in that mess, David says, I believe and therefore I speak. You know, he, he used to be out there in the field with, with, with the sheep and, and he had good meals to eat and he enjoyed the communion of his family and his father and mother. And all of a sudden, God comes along and says, I have made you a king. And he winds up in a cave. And God comes along to you and me and says, you're my child. You're a child of the king. You'll inherit eternal life. I have given unto you eternal life. You'll never perish no one, no one is able to pluck you out of my, my hand, my father's hand. And as, and as David's spirit guided him to a profession of his faith, that's a genitive there, by the way, faith's spirit or the spirit's faith. And to speaking what he believed, so we also speak and will speak according to, to what we believe. And this is in the context of being troubled on every side, perplexed, persecuted, torn down, bearing about, about in the body the putting to death of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's no wonder Paul quoted this, uh, quoted David here. He was put to death by his own people. Folks, Christ was put to death by His own people. And we carry about in our body the, the putting to death of the, Lord, of the Lord Jesus Christ. According as it is written. You know, when David wrote those words, he was greatly afflicted. In these circumstances, he prayed to God and he expressed confidence in Him. He placed all his reliance on him. In his affliction, he spoke of his confidence in God. He proclaimed his reliance on God. His speaking being the result of his belief or, or of his putting confidence in God. His faith, the faithfulness of God. The Spirit of God is the author of this faith. This is not of ourselves, of our own power. It is the, the free gift of God. It's the product of His power. 
That is what God calls the spirit of faith. David believed. Paul believed. Therefore, they spoke. We also believe, therefore, we speak. We speak freely, without any doubt about these things. We, we speak boldly, without the fear of consequences. We speak sincerely, honestly, faithfully, not corrupting the Word of God. We speak honestly, sincerely, in the sight of God. Where, where that Jesus Christ is the main subject of our ministry. Because we believe in Him. Nothing, 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 nothing can stop our mouths from speaking of Him. Suffering persecution for the sake of it. By, an, by an, a religious system, by the way, that God calls the world. Cosmos. The world system. Verse 13 speaks of the faithfulness of God, not our faith. This is not faith that we drum up. This is the Spirit of God that directs us to the faithfulness of God. And folks, we see the same thing with Abraham. Same thing. I, this is the consistency that I'm talking about here. You know, Abraham, he didn't have any kids. God said, you're going to have kids. By your wife, Sarah, he said, you're crazy, or sort of like that, you know. Everything you could look at was a disaster, but he knew a God who was able to bring life out of death. And our, it was Sarah that said, you know, that's nah, crazy, not, not Abraham. And our testimony is of the faithfulness of God, not ourselves. Psalm 116, verse 10. I believe, therefore, have I spoken... I was greatly afflicted. And read the next verse, verse 11. I said in my haste, that's the King James Version, says haste. Uh, it means alarm. I said in my alarm, in my panic, all men are liars. <laughs> that's interesting. I'd never seen that before. It kind of took me back a bit. Verse 14 is where we look knowing that He who raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise us up, raise us, raise up us also with Jesus and pre present us with you. The only way that you know that you're going to be raised up with Jesus and presented with, uh, you know, the rest of us or with, with each other is the body of Christ is... You, it's one. And because God told you. There is no scientific investigation that would establish that truth. Now that's supremely more important than whether or not there was ever an ark. Here's something that you cannot know by human logic or human reasoning. You, you only know it. You know it and you only know it because of the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, His Spirit bears with witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Verse 15. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. The sense is that the overflowing grace and the salvation of many would so abound as to, as to promote the glory of God. That should be what we want. We're not seeking our own glory. You know, the glory of God, His true value, His true worth. All things are for your sakes. Paul has already implied that his life is not his own. We, we, we read the same thought in Colossians. Back, I believe, in the first chapter somewhere. You know, filling up that which is, which is lacking in the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for His body's sake, which is the church. 
in 2 Timothy, uh, we read, I endure all things for the elect's sake. You don't endure anything for the tares' sake, okay? <laughs> or the goats' sake, okay? Verse 16, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, I don't think that's the physical flesh, I think it's the old man, yet the inward man, that is the new creation, the inward man is renewed day by day. Folks, the greatest expression of love is death. Sacrifice. If we don't understand, folks, His sacrifice, we don't understand His love. If we don't understand our death with Christ, it's one thing that He died for us, but we also died with Him. And if we don't understand that, we don't understand the life that's made manifest in our mortal flesh. As we walk through this world, in, through this life, in this life that God's given us, not I, but Christ. The old man is being made to, that's a passive voice, being made to perish. Okay? The, the word means thoroughly corrupt, totally depraved, utterly corrupt, through and through. Decaying. And we have nothing to do with the flesh because God doesn't have anything to do with the flesh. And we're not under law because God never gave the church the law. Verse 17, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, boy, it sure seems like a lot longer than that, compared, compared to in the light of eternity, works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Uh, the word light affliction there in the Greek means a little, a, little, a little weight to bear, easy to bear, easily managed, not burdensome. Folks, only God's grace can do that and gender that. The law certainly won't. Verse 18, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Dearly beloved, we walk by faith, not by sight. You're not, you're not to walk looking at all that garbage in your life. Things are, are not always as they appear, okay? You know, Persecution may not appear to be profitable, but it is in view of eternity. I'm going to go out on a limb and I'm going to suggest that many sincere Christians today evaluate their position before God, you know, by their condition. Or, or you know, they determine their position by their present circumstances. You know, oh God, I don't feel loved. I don't feel forgiven. I don't feel redeemed. This is just too heavy to bear. You know, God must have something against me. And so on, so on, so on. I love you all, I truly do. And my constant prayer for all of you is you would just come to realize just how much God loves you and what He's done for you. And rest in that. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.